Hello, I'm Jake Boudreau, civic journalist at Telo Community Television. This week, on the record, we attended the June 10th Committee of the Whole session of Richmond Municipal Council. Then on June 13th, a special meeting was held by Richmond Municipal Council to approve its budget. At the Committee of the Whole session of Richmond Municipal Council on June 10th, the first presentation of the evening was from Terry Smith of Destination Cape Breton about their 2024-2027 tourism strategy for the island. The next item on the agenda is the good part. Uh, we get to hear from members of the public regarding uh, several items this evening. The first up is Terry Smith with Destination Cape Breton regarding their 2024-2027 strategy. So welcome back, Mr. Smith, great to have you. So, uh, strategy, uh, just a few things in terms of the context. We always look at the, what the economists are saying. They're projecting right now for, uh, for our, our Canada economy that it's slow growth for this year. It's started going to start to get a little bit better in the second half of this year, so the summer and into the fall, uh, but then being uh, steadier in uh, 2025 and 2026. U.S. will do a little bit better. Uh, and that's just a, a quote from Destination Canada that basically says what, what I, uh, I was just saying, that we experienced strong economic headwinds from inflation and higher interest rates will continue to impact disposable incomes in 2024. We just uh, completed uh, community meetings with, with tourism operators around the island, uh, including one in uh, Discoose and one in St. Peter's. And... Um, um, I asked operators there, you know, how are your bookings looking? And it was all over the map. So I, I think, I think, you know, if, if we can match what we did last year, we will be doing good, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, one of the themes that, that, uh, I guess the two themes that, that are in our new strategy are, uh, uh, really investing in digital automation. That's something using AI and tools and things like that. That's something that we're, uh, we're leaning into. But at the same time, it's really important for us to uh, not lose sight of the fact that a big part of our brand as Cape Breton Island is our people, our hospitality. So we have to also accentuate that human touch, real human connection, and that's uh, built into our strategy as well. Um, now this is, it's really small on the screen, but tourism employment in Nova Scotia. So, so we've had, uh, coming out of the pandemic, uh, significant workforce shortages. Uh, I won't go through all of this, but it, 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 in a nutshell, basically most of the industry has recovered in terms of employment. The one area where there's a gap is in food and beverage. Um, uh, across the province, it's almost 4,000 positions that we're short right now compared to pre-pandemic. And um, CBU did some research uh, the past year of uh, uh, operators on the island, and the number one unfilled position on the island is cooks. And, uh, you know, I was talking to uh, 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 Robin Cotton with Seal, Seal Cove uh, in Lewisdale, uh, and, uh, and he had to get somebody to come here through through uh, immigration so so that that's what we have to resort to to address this problem so still a challenge in that area just a few highlights um, so we worked uh, the, with the partnership um, with uh, Cape Smoky um, and, and uh, the CBU and a few other partners on an economic impact assessment for the tourism industry this past year uh, the partnership really took the lead on this um, and um, one of the things that the consultants did within this report was they prepared um, uh, scenarios in terms of future growth. Like if, if you do this, this will be the economic result. And uh, there's three of the scenarios that they looked at that uh, we said, okay, these can have really strong returns, so we want to focus on them. One is extending the length of stay. So right now, the length of stay uh, on Cape Breton Island, according to the most recent tourism Nova Scotia stats, is 4.4 days. They said if we can extend that by one day, that would equate to $125 million uh, per year in extra economic impact. Um, growing year-round tourism, if we can increase uh, tourism between November and April by 12%, that would equate to $70 million. And attracting high-value visitors, people that uh, will, will spend a little bit more, if we increase the average visitor spend by 10%, that 
58 million. So we looked at that research and uh, we, we said, okay, that gives us some, some solid information upon which to build our, uh, our plan for growing uh, our industry. So we have six goals and three of them uh, are, are directly related to, the, to that study. So uh, the goals are enhance the brand as a bucket list destination, one of the top islands in the world, responsibly grow visitation, emphasizing shoulder and winter seasons, increase the average length of stay by one day, increase average visitor spend by 10%, elevate the quality of the visitor experience, and become recognized as a truly sustainable and inclusive destination. So I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights from the strategy um, related to each one of those goals. But enhancing the brand, we have a new campaign. You may have seen it. I don't know if you've been watching the news and on uh, uh, Live at 5 or News at 6 particularly. You, you might see our, our, uh, our TV ad. Uh, but it's all focused on those authentic connections with the island, its culture, and its people. So uh, we're, we're hearing, we're getting... Solid reviews on that, so uh, so we're 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 pleased with uh, with what it looks like, and it's all about smiles, like you're seeing there in, in that that uh, photo. Um, concierge network. So this is one thing that we're building towards. Um, uh, we're working with our visitor information centers around the island, and we're we're really trying to support them more. We used to. Uh, this goes back probably seven or eight years, but our, our organization used to play a, a stronger role in managing and supporting uh, visitor information centers. We got paid a good chunk of change by the province to do so, so we couldn't do that anymore. But uh, we have some more resources. We feel that uh, all these folks are, are uh, key uh, folks in terms of making that human connection, but helping people learn what there is to do in in uh, in the area and hopefully stay longer so we're investing more into uh, those folks uh, and uh, official ambassador program so Cape Breton University uh, created a Cape Breton Island ambassador micro credential it's basically it's a fancy word but it's an online uh, uh, course that you can take uh, it takes about an hour uh, it depends upon you can go at your own pace but it takes a, roughly about an hour, um, but they, they've had a, quite a few people go through this, and we're talking to them about uh, um, building this into a program, like a network of volunteers across the island that we could mobilize in some way to uh, uh, help us, uh, again, promote that, that human connection, but, but uh, play a role in some way. Growing year-round visitation, uh, so with the marketing levy uh, expanding, uh, that well, a big chunk of, uh, of that will be invested into our marketing, of course. Uh, so we're expanding our marketing program, mainly more uh, advertising, uh, primarily digital advertising, and the creation of more content. So you will see us capturing more photography, more videos, and, and so forth developing more blog posts, more itineraries, things like that on our website. We will also have an increased events focus. Um, uh, we are, uh, events can play a significant role in uh, attracting visitors in our shoulder and winter seasons in particular. So uh, we'll be trying to do both uh, attracting events, but also working with existing events to see how they might be able to grow and, and expand. Um, and uh, for example, I've had some discussions about uh, uh, the uh, the Lobster Fest in St. Peter's, and uh, I, I've planted in their in their minds maybe that could be bigger. Maybe it could include, you know, the whole South Coast. But anyway, these are just preliminary things. But we we have to start dreaming and looking at these things. Um, continuing to develop uh, winter, spring, and fall. Uh, right now, you can see a photo there of uh, the, the Grand River Falls, but we have uh, waterfall season uh, that, that we've uh, started a couple of years ago. And that's going on right now. We're seeing an increase, and we have an app for that, increase in app downloads and, and, and scans. When you get the app, there's signs at all of these waterfalls that you go and you scan, and you can uh, win, win a, a getaway. Um, and increasing air access. So we're working closely with the Sydney Airport, in terms of uh, increasing air access into there. But we're also uh, talking to the folks at the Alan J. McCacken Airport. We think there could be potential for a seasonal uh, commercial route, even if it was one day a week, uh, to go into there. So that's something that we're uh, going to look at building 
business case uh, with, with the airport uh, for. Increasing length of stay. Um, one of the things that happens with Cape Breton is uh, people get the idea, um, and, and there's a number of reasons why everybody talks about the Cabot Trail. They, they think that they can come to the island, do the west side of the trail one day, the east side the next day, and then they're off somewhere else. And uh, so we're, we've, we've been trying, but we've got to do more to combat that with week-long week stay messaging. For example, there's many tour operators out there that have uh, uh, itineraries that could be Nova Scotia itinerary or Maritimes itinerary, and um, they will you know, have maybe one night, maybe two nights in Cape Breton, and we're telling them, you're missing an awful lot of this destination. So, so, uh, so we're working on that. Uh, focusing on curating as many events around the island a as possible. That was one of the things we did in all these community meetings. So our visitors um, love to go to events where they can rub shoulders with locals. They want to almost feel like they're a local when they're, when they're here. So whether it's a trivia night or a community dinner, things like that, those are, uh, we might not always think of them as something that visitors might want to do. But, uh, but they do, and we're, we're going to try to capture as many of those things as possible. Get them spending more money and get them um, staying longer, hopefully. Uh, we have a new mobile app, a travel companion, it's called, that uh, will be released uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks. That uh, It's built, it has a little bit of AI generated in there, so it learns people's interests and, and makes suggestions based on where they are on the island and what they're interested in. The other thing to note about this is that it's, uh, it's all self-compact, so um, um, all of the data when you download the app, you have all of the data, so it will work regardless if there's cell service. Uh, there's a little bit more functionality when there is cell service, but it will work when there isn't. Um, increasing the average length of stay, um, one thing uh, we have to work with communities on evening economies. So there's a tourism consultant that we've brought in here from the U.S. Uh, a number of times. Uh, Roger Brooks is his name. He's got this stat that 70% uh, of non-accommodation spending happens after 6 p.m. on shopping, dining, and entertainment. And there are many communities, um, many communities in, in your county too, where uh, things close up a little earlier. Um, and, um, and so we've got to look at how do we tackle that? Could, could people open a, an hour later in, in the day to then stay open an hour later? Things like that. It's challenging, especially for you know, uh, people in, in the restaurant business when they're struggling with uh, staffing. But it's something that we have to work, work towards. Uh, targeting more high-value guests in our marketing campaigns, as I mentioned, uh, that, that's one of those areas where the consultants said that that, that has a huge payoff. So uh, we'll be looking at that. And uh, we're looking at a booking engine um, as well. Um, that won't be this year, but 2025, we'll be incorporating that into our website and into that app I mentioned. Elevating the visitor experience. Um, we work with partners uh, regularly with Tourism Nova Scotia and Parks Canada, uh, supporting the development of new experiences. That's something that will continue. Um, about that food and beverage uh, workforce issue, um, we're going to put together a task force. I already talked to a few people that, that we'd like to get involved with that. NSCC, for example. Um, Drew, uh, is it McIntyre? Stevens. Drew Stevens, yes, Drew Stevens, okay. I know another Drew McIntyre that uses it with all of the Drew Stevens, yeah. So, so Drew and I have talked about that, and this is something that we're going to work on, Restaurant Association of Nova Scotia as well, and seeing like what, what can we reasonably do. Uh, growing marine tourism is uh, another uh, area that, uh, that we feel there is, is potential, um, and we've been working with some of our partners, including St. Peter's Marina, on, uh, on how we can uh, attract more uh, boaters here. Um, and, um, and there's a few infrastructure things that, uh, that we have to look at, expanding the hours, hopefully, of the St. Peter's Canal. Um, but there could also be, you know, this, this is uh, a county where, where there are many places where boaters can, can go, so um, we've got to highlight all of those, those areas. And implementing an investment attraction program. This is something... Tyler Mathis and I will be, will be talking about, but uh, we have a need in some communities for new investments. Um, 
and uh, we have a number of uh, uh, new entrants to the industry who have invested in in uh, um, new accommodations, uh, new new restaurants, and things in recent years. It's good that we're seeing that, um, uh, but we're, we need more investment. And I'll just give you an example um, in um, in the Marguerite area. Um, they had uh, what used to be the Marguerite Lodge. It was bought by Cabot Links. They've turned it into staff housing. Um, <coughs> they, they've also lost uh, another smaller inn that got turned into a private residence. Another smaller inn, just uh, the owners retired, but they live there, so they're closing it. And so Marguerite doesn't have enough bedrooms in their community and it's in, in need of new investment and new accommodations. So attracting somebody that can fill that, that, uh, that gap. Um, and finally, being sustainable and inclusive, um, we have an application into ACOA to develop a sustainable tourism plan for the island, and um, hopefully I'm going to hear on that soon. And working with partners to roll out equity, diversity, and inclusion training initiatives. Um, so things like, for example, We've recently become rainbow registered uh, to uh, um, to go through a process to be more welcoming to our uh, to us LGBTQ plus community, and um, there are about half a dozen operators on the island uh, that have gone through that. Pepper Place Inn in St. Peter's is one of them, I know, uh, but we we'd like to see more operators go through that training. Um, there's, uh, there's also, we've been talking with Nova Scotia Indigenous Tourism and Cape Breton University about rolling out a program for uh, Mi'kmaq uh, cultural training. So that, that's another initiative. Um, and um, uh, one thing that's happening right now at Dalhousie University, they have an institute that is doing some research on accessibility in tourism. And um, so they will, uh, they, they have a report coming out soon, so based on what that report finds, we'll take our cue from them and hopefully roll out some things for, for the industry. And I know that's a lot of information, but uh, happy to take any questions. And you can see the full uh, strategy there, or I can, I can uh, send it through. Thanks, Terry, so much. Um, just, uh, I guess, right off the bat, I love the idea of the uh, ambassador program, and I did some poking around on the CBU website. Not super easy to figure out how to register for it. That's one little piece of feedback I would give, um, because I'd be in it, like, right away <laughs> if I could figure that out. So if you can maybe pass on that piece of feedback. Um, but, you know, 100% uh, excited to hear about the concierge network service, because I think the work that you're doing is going to be multiplied exponentially when you have when you increase the number of champions around the island, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so questions, councillors, or comments? Yeah, no, it's not a question as much as just I found it interesting when you commented on the situation with the wildfires last year because I had two, just in passing, like anecdotally, two operators in the be in Victoria County mm -hmm. that both you know said almost the exact same thing. They were surprised at the amount of bookings they had lost based on media coverage and people phoning and saying no not coming kind of thing because of the fires and nowhere near here right yeah. and that's that's really tough because it's a you know when those operators it's hard to hard to fight against that yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> sorry uh just so you were one of the things that that we're uh, uh working on so let me start. We've talked to the province about this, and we've said, you know, totally understand. Like you've got like uh, an, an emergency on your hands, uh, but for for tourism Nova Scotia, maybe if their role could be to uh, to get more of the message out about where is safe to visit, mm -hmm. and try to correct, uh, just just to you know, educate potential visitors on on you know what what's happening out there so uh, so it, it's it's a hard balance but we're also we're working on an open for business uh, campaign that's ready to roll out so if a disaster happens and I mean we even saw it with Fiona where the eastern part of the island you know w suffered more damage but you know there's people in other parts of the island that are saying we're open we're ready for business but nobody's coming and uh, so you, you do have to balance that. And some people will say, well, that, that's a little tone deaf, but 
there's people that this is their livelihood at the same time. So you have to balance that being sensitive to the emergency, but, but understanding that people are trying to run a business. Yeah, and I think there's definitely some practical things that if, uh, you know, folks at places like Tourism Nova Scotia could do, even if it was to message out to operators in unaffected areas, you know, here's some ideas that you might want to do ahead of, you know, because there's this disaster going on in another place. So, yeah. No, great point. Um, any other questions? Yeah, just uh, what tweaked my interest, uh, Terry, is that uh, the extra one-day stay that would accumulate to or add up to $125 million. So uh, any kind of uh, indication there or any kind of ideas on, on how to uh, extend that and get that extra day uh, for visitors? Or Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. One of the things will be uh, creating more content that educates people on uh, on everywhere there is to go around the island. Um, we'll be looking at some of those tour operators that I mentioned. We'll be bringing them in on uh, familiarization tours so they can understand, you know, what there is in this part part of the island and, and so forth. So um, it's. Uh, there's, it's a multifaceted approach, but uh, it, it, it basically takes a lot of work, a lot of messaging, and, and there's probably need for some new investment, too. Um, sometimes it's giving people compelling reasons why they want to come to, to other parts of the island. I mean, where, where, where my mind goes, uh, Terry, and being in the tourism industry myself, uh, you know, I, I, I think of package deals. You know what I mean? Like when we look at this county, for example, there's almost a festival every week in the summertime, right? Uh, so, you know, trying to have the mentality and having the approach that, you know, you know, it, it could be complementary and not competitive. I know we're all, everybody's fighting for a piece of the pie or whatever, right? But if things could be complementary instead of competitive to say, you know, we're having this festival this week and next week it's a festival in Alma Dam and the following week it's one in Lourdes and one in St. Peter's and put package deals together to the point where maybe a visitor gets the tail end of one festival and the beginning of the following festival and you extend that stay by one day right so that's yeah great thank you deputy warden and thank you terry i think we'll have to leave it there for questions for this evening in response to the destination key breton um report um, you know in years past sometimes you see advertisements so it was Lewisburg and mm -hmm. the cabot trail and and uh, different i guess attractions outside of richmond county uh, but now it seems like Destination Cape Breton really wants to include Richmond. Do you feel that Richmond has been well represented in the 2024-2027 uh, strategy? Yeah, I, look, I think everything's a process and, you know, certainly there are beautiful attractions all over Cape Breton Island. Um, we have a particular bias, though, that uh, Richmond County has, of course, lots to offer uh, tourists and our, you know, who want to visit the island. So I'm really pleased to be able to see that Destination Cape Breton is so, you know, a lot more proactively uh, promoting uh, our region as a destination and what I really like to hear from them is that they're working with operators and they're working with communities because really that's where the offerings are going to come from. Those authentic experiences that people are looking for means that we have to have people who live here uh, you know all the time be able to welcome visitors as well. So the things that were you know part of the things that were interesting to me about that presentation were some of the micro credentials around the island ambassadors and you know uh, there's I know there's a customer service excellence one as well um, so I think seeing those kinds of things that will directly impact uh, the tourism industry here in Richmond County that that helps to build a lot of faith in what uh, the approach is that Destination Cape Breton is taking in the new strategy. Do you think a seasonal commercial route at the uh, Helen J. McCacken Regional Airport is, is a viable um, thing for the airport for the area. Well, I think it's definitely something that should be explored. We know we you know we have a lot of people who commute back and forth, and what that commercial service might look like, I think, will in part determine whether or not it's viable. So, if we're looking at something uh, that's you know too frequent or too infrequent or whatever the case may be, it's probably not going to work. But I think the trick will be getting it you know to a point where it's kind of right sized for the region. There's a lot of industry uh, traffic here as well. Uh, 
because of our heavy industrial parks and the work that's going on in the Strait of Kent. So, so it kind of gives an opportunity for more than just sort of a tourism only uh, opportunity. Um, so I'll be really interested to see what their research and, and kind of feasibility around that uh, looks like because I, I, you know, I do think that that's a major asset for us, uh, you know, particularly, like I said, for Richmond County because of our industrial uh, nature. But um, I think, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of it. I'd love to see something like that succeed here. Now, is it realistic to convince local businesses, groups, service providers uh, to stay open longer? Um, is that something that can be done? Well, you know, that's the million dollar question, literally. And I know how hard our tourism operators work. And I know, you know, we saw from uh, Terry today, the stats that he presented show that there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people missing. Um, and particularly in cook positions from our, our hospitality industry. So, you know, is it feasible? Uh, you know, probably not without some additional support. Um, but what I'm, you know, I'm really encouraged by the fact that they're continuing to collaborate with individual operators to see what is in the art of the possible for them uh, because there's no question we hear that and even you know during uh, later in the season during Celtic colors and, and the like you know we, we do hear from tourists that they're looking for more places to eat and you know later in the evening and to get gas and to you know uh, all of the things that you do when you when you come here as a tourist so um, so we know it's an issue from an offering perspective but we also completely understand we need to be understanding of the labor crunch they're facing because it's quite massive and and they're working their fingers to the bone literally so, um, you know, I think it'll remain to be seen whether or not it's, it's possible for more tourism operators to stay open later um, to have increased offerings. Um, so I would say stay tuned for that. Um, but I think the only way we're going to get there is that if we work together, and that was part of the DCBA, the, the Destination Cape Breton presentation this evening was really on that collaboration. How can we kind of support each other? Can marine tourism in Richmond County actually grow or is it at a point where we're getting the as much marine tourism as we could possibly get right now and really there's not much growth there. How do you see that? Well, it's a bit of a crystal ball question, but I, you know, from my perspective and seeing what happens in other areas of the, of the world and, you know, having gone and vacationed to different places myself, I think there's massive opportunity for marine tourism in Cape Breton. Uh, you know, in any, in many other regions of the world with an asset, although there's no asset quite like the Bredora Lake, uh, you know, in, in other regions of the world where there are lakes, you know, that they're, they're peppered with sailboats and, and all kinds of different pleasure craft. And so I think, um, you know, when you look out at our Bredora Lake, it is an under utilized asset from a from a marine perspective and I, I would point to the lake specifically for that because it's such a unique um, region in our on our island I mean we're, we're a designated biosphere uh, but you know through through the efforts of the Bredore Lake Biosphere Association and so you know from from my perspective when I look at um, you know what we have now and the assets that we have in place to build on the, the possibilities frankly are endless and you know keeping in mind that we have an entire ocean front as well um, so so the, the, the fact that we have boat waterfronts on both the lake side and the ocean side really double the opportunity for us. And so I'm, I think there's a huge, a huge potential um, for more development in, in, in along our waterfronts and also in our marinas specifically. Tommy Sampson with the Lewisdale Vines Club made a presentation to council requesting $20,000 for a $1.4 million project on the waterfront in Lewisdale. So the next item on our agenda, we've got a lot of quick, an extra presentation this evening. We had an opportunity come up from the Lewisdale Lions Club. So Tommy Sampson, I'm going to ask you to come to the table. Um, thank you for your, you know, for sending along that presentation, and I'm glad we were able to make this timing work. We don't like to throw anything away, and we don't waste any opportunities. So uh, when La Cuisine Acadienne closed, and I actually don't know how many years ago it closed, but it's been a while. Um, they tore the building down, I think it was three years ago or two years ago, I can't remember. Um, but there was a deck in the back of this facility. It was a massive deck. And it was all pressure treated. And whoever had built this, this particular structure had really done a great job with the underground work. And so there was absolutely no, no rot on this deck. And so the concern was when you see an excavator on the property with a claw, you're, you're looking at the value of that deck in today's market and you're seeing you know, a $25,000 tag. And so uh, the woman who owned this donated it to us. So of course, in a very informal way, we stopped traffic coming both ways in a school zone, and we floated the deck down to the waterfront property. And then we chopped it up, and uh, I've, I've got a few photos there um, coming up. But we had community members who owned tractors come out 
Um, Cart Sampson was one of them with the skid steer, Brian Marshall on with his tractor. And then there's another smaller tractor there as well. And we chopped this up to fit around our current facility, recycling the actual deck, uh, restoring the deck, and then providing kind of a new home and a new space. And you can see all the safety equipment that the senior members of our community use. You can see the sandals and the shorts and, uh, and the chainsaw as a precision tool. Uh, as I move forward, you can't, be, you can't make this stuff up. It just, it is what it is. Yep. You, you question it, but at the end of it, this thing came together. It's just a fantastic project. And so as people saw this stuff happening, uh, they stopped. They drove by, they stopped, they offered help. Do you guys need help? Do you need assistance? Can we help out? And so at the end of it, we had over 30 people involved with kind of repiecing this together and giving it a whole new life. So it was a great project. And so the end result was we had a deck, a wraparound deck on the, on the building up by the road, and then we have a performance stage deck down on the bottom, which was also part of the original deck. And so we gave both of them a new life. And the couple you see in the corner down there is a couple from Quebec. They were, they were traveling, touring Cape Breton Island, and um, they had got as far as Lewisdale coming through. They were, they were on their way to Almadam, and their car broke down. And so they stopped. They called um, CAA. And uh, anyway, they got their vehicle picked up, and it was brought back to Port Hawkesbury. And the gentleman who picked the vehicle up said, well, if you guys are looking to just have a picnic, there's a place in Newsdale where you can stop. And so they showed up, and they were all French, and they chatted with us for a bit. And then they just held hands and walked down, you know, late 70s, walked down to the water, sat at the picnic table, and they sat for the better part of four hours while their vehicle was repaired. And so had we had more to offer on this property vendor booths, things like that, uh, they may have spent more money. So this brought us one step closer to uh, where we want to be. And while all of that was happening, uh, we collected eyeglasses, CPAP machines, pop can tabs for wheelchairs, provided meals on wheel service. We ran Father's Day events with annual donations of $1,500 to both the Straight Richmond Hospital and the St. Ann Center. We helped with medical needs uh, in the community and outside of our immediate community all across Richmond County. We provided space for cadet programming. We have Canada Summer Jobs for Student Employment. We offer bursaries for high school graduates. We maintain a lift chair program for seniors across Richmond County uh, who are in need. We fundraised for families in need. We held meetings. We renovated facilities. And we recently provided space for and signed a 20-year lease agreement with our local food bank. And the list goes on and on. I would have had more members with me tonight, but they are actually catering a meal for the international students and their host families. <laughs> and it just, it is what it is. So they couldn't make it. Uh, so this is the property we're, we're talking about. This is its current state. Uh, it's, it's on Seal Cove Harbor. Beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, very serene. And that's the current condition of it, um, as, as it is right now. And this is the vision. This is what we're looking at. And so the lower level of this property will become an outdoor amphitheater. And the upper level <clears throat> will become the, where you can see those people walking. There's uh, kind of a flat space there where we can set up for washer toss and ladder ball and things like that. And along the left-hand side of the property, you can see three vendor booths where we're hoping to encourage local artisans to bring their stuff out whenever there's events hosted here. Uh, and then the facility that you see there now is the current facility but we're not looking at keeping that. So we've advertised this at our breakfasts since January of 2024. We post this uh, as kind of as a running loop at our breakfasts. And so our commitment so far for this property, uh, in 2022, we transported and restored the deck. So estimated value at that time was 15 grand with the current cost of and rate of inflation. I think it's somewhere around 25 now with the cost of lumber. Uh, we donated, we had machine time donated from both Cart Sampson and Brian Marshawn to relocate those pieces and put them all in place. In 2023, we had an expenditure of almost 50,000 to complete our shoreline protection, so armor stone and aggregate, uh, basically preventing the erosion of the property because we were losing quite a bit at the end of every winter. And then in 2023, we had concept drawings done, which you've just seen for the waterfront project and we paid for those as well. And then in 2024, if the funding is allocated, uh, we're going to be donating our current facility to the Barishwa Trail Association. So 
We've already been in contact with the, the kind of the lead organizer there, Duane, and they will be using that facility for trail maintenance equipment and development. Uh, so that building is 16 by 24. It's got full wiring, full insulation, cupboards, all of that stuff. Uh, the estimated value for the facility is 25000 but our goal is to keep that within, you know, um, an organization that is building community. And the Barishwa Trail Association was, uh, was really excited to hear about that. Yep. And I know you're almost at the end. Of the yeah. Yep. The this is the new facility plans, which is constantly changing. We just got um, the quote for the elevator that we're adding into this to make the building barrier free. That's 125,000. So it it adds quite a bit, but we think it's worth it. It's a worthwhile investment. Uh, the rest of the park is barrier free with uh, full pave and all that stuff. So if you look at the kind of the layout of that, one of the things that's also going in is historical placards, which will speak of the history of the community. And it will also honor uh, Alfred Sampson, who's kind of a, a longtime resident of Lewesdale and worked with the NHL pretty much his whole life. God bless his heart, he was a Montreal Canadiens fan. And, uh, and he made a lot of significant contributions to, to the community of Lewesdale, particularly the community homes and bringing back residents and uh, and he's just an amazing, he was an amazing person. And so in addition to all of that, we're putting a um, solar system on the roof of this facility. And so we're going to try and minimize our costs so that as community groups would like to use it, we can minimize what the expenses are. And then within that, uh, we're looking for a full ice cream vending station where we can provide an additional service to the community of Lewisdale and potentially employ another student through Canada Summer Jobs. So the estimated cost is 1.4 million with the quotes we've received so far. Uh, we've already got approval from EDPC for uh, development on the property, so it falls within their lines. And so we're ready. Um, Mike Kellaway is on board with this. We spoke with Mike. Uh, Trevor Bourgeois, LNA, MLA, is on board. Tim Houston has seen this, this presentation as well, and he was very excited about it. And so the, the asks that we're looking for from council, and it's not a decision obviously you need to make tonight because we haven't submitted our package yet, but we're, we'd be looking for support in the amount of 20000 And so we believe that it's time for some infrastructure development in Lewisdale, and we think that that community piece of property, uh, which is one of the only community-owned pieces of property in, in our village, is just an opportunity waiting to happen. And so looking down the road, we can see some boat tours leaving Seal Cove Harbor, heading out into the passage, running around some of the, you know, the fishing grounds of Almadam. There's just an unlimited amount of potential uh, with this property. So we're asking for your help and your consideration, keeping in mind that we know you have all kinds of asks coming across your plate. So I'll do my best to answer questions if you have any. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Tommy. Um, so... Can you, can you just explain to me what you mean by municipal-led projects? Do you mean that when you say the facelift, do you mean the streetscape and facade yeah. programs? Okay, yeah. okay. And that one was, I think, Arishat, and then years ago, but St. Yeah. Peter's wasn't municipal. St. Peter's was... Uh, it, no, it was the Regional Development Agency. No, it was the Regional Development Agency and the St... They're, on, they're non-profit group. Speedo. Yes, Speedo, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but same deal. Yeah, yeah. same deal. Um, okay, I just wondered if that's what you meant. Um, so, uh, councillors, do you have any questions for Tommy? Comments? I mean, it's a very thorough presentation. And by the way, uh, good strategic choice in putting all those smiling faces and pictures of all the people participating in your presentation. It's hard for me to find pictures where no one's smiling. Right? And tons of people. I and, mean, you know, and it's, it's a great example of the way that the clients clubs are able to bring people together. It's, it's, quite, it's quite nice to see. It's really heartwarming. Um, and I know that we do have a fund set aside through our CCBF funds for waterfront development. There's potential that we could consider that through this. It's part of our capital plan that we intend to potentially approve on, on Thursday evening at our sure. special meeting. Um, I'll go through staff to find oh, out. just press your button. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And I'll go through staff to find out what the proper channels are in terms of the application and mm -hmm. how that's supposed to be submitted. Yeah. Uh, it's just the numbers mm -hmm. with this elevator mm -hmm. expanded piece that it's changed things. So now we just got to mm -hmm. include that into the package. So. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and um, you know, I think uh, 
I think we're always we always have an appetite. This council generally has had a real appetite to support community initiatives, and you know if you're looking for twenty thousand dollars to leverage one point four million, yeah. that's pretty you know that's pretty impressive. So um, you know that's new money into our communities. So yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions, Councillor Melanie? Did you want to? No. No. Just glad that you, we were able to squeeze you in today when you sent the presentation. I just really felt it was something that the public should really see, not just us, because it, it was. It's a very impressive uh, presentation, and certainly the work the lines have done over the years is not unnoticed by anybody in the county. I don't think, and just really looking forward to seeing the application and, and encourage you to do it. I would say sooner than later before we break for the summer, and then we can maybe allocate you some money. All right. Thank you so much, Tommy. We'll leave it there. All right. Thanks, Do you believe there's a willingness around the council table uh, to help the Lewisdale Lions Club project 2024? Uh, or is it kind of too early to tell uh, what you guys are able to do. Yeah, I, I definitely got, got the sense that there was a strong interest from council. And I mean, you know, Councillor Melanie Sampson does a great job, you know, representing her community. And she was a big advocate to bring this this project forward in a presentation. It was a full agenda, as you saw this evening. Um, but I'm really glad that she did. Um, because I think, you know, having those presentations to give us the kind of background and the history and, and the context of what they're trying to achieve and what they've already achieved. That's the thing you have to keep in mind. They're an organization that is demonstrated the ability to move projects forward time and again and that's through a lot of hard work and effort by a lot of volunteers so I definitely think there's an interest around the table I think what will remain to be seen is you know what is going to be our budgetary capacity to support the project I'm really hopeful that we can support it through our Canada Community Building Fund or specifically your mark for waterfront development um, but you know we'll have to wait and see you know because that involves other partners at various levels of government as well right so um, so I think yes to the interest interest and congratulate congratulate them on a great uh, presentation and a, and a great I guess track record um, of doing good good work in the community um, but hopefully we'll be able to find a way to support that project municipal staff provided information on the provincial share the road initiative for off-highway vehicles um, the next item on our agenda is uh, new business, and it's a share the road project. So we've received a memo from staff uh, regarding, uh, I guess, the the provincial initiative to look at sharing the road for off-highway vehicles so that they can access uh, trails and services along designated road shoulders. Um, and so it doesn't mean that riders can ride anywhere on the road. There was a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding around that when it first came out from the provincial government. That is not what it means. Um, what happens is there there is a process to allow road travel in approved locations and the sites uh, basically were uh, provided to the government by at vans and they're at, they're actively gathering additional information however we had asked staff some time ago to look into how we make this happen in our community because I know there are several hot spots for where people need to, or want to be able to access services when they're using OHVs and I think it would be you know I think we talked about it being part of uh, like 12 month of the year tourism strategy and how we could generate additional economic spin-off there um, so um, our our uh, Staff has been in touch with um, the coordinator for Atvans, and it's looking like we need to have a bylaw in place to give access to municipal roads for OHVs when they want to access them. Now, that's specific to municipal roads. Most of our roads are provincial. However, uh, there may, you know, there may be a need for this at a, you know, on some of our roads as well. So the idea would be to look for a motion to essentially defer this to policy and bylaw for future discussion. Councillor Brent? Yeah, um, I'd be happy to make that motion. Thank you to Shannon for the work on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, the motion's been made. Could I have a seconder, please? I'll second the motion. Thank you, Councillor Melanie Sampson. Any further discussion on that item? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that motion is carried, so please do extend our thanks to Shannon and team. How long do you think it will take to approve a bylaw to allow ETVs to access municipal roads? Uh, is that just a formality? Do you, do you anticipate any 
resistance or, or pushback to, to such a thing? I don't really uh, anticipate too much resistance to that. I mean, there, you know, there may be some people who have concerns and we certainly through the bylaw process, we'll, we'll be hosting a you know, public hearing, you know, when we get to that point. Um, and certainly our residents are welcome to reach out to us at any time. But the reality is, is there, are, there, are, there are very few municipal roads in Richmond County. Most of our roads are provincially owned. The vast majority are provincially owned. So this bylaw will only impact um, a small number of roads. And I know that there are other municipalities that have already gone this route. So getting the getting the language behind, ensuring that it's uh, that it's you know an appropriately written bylaw, you know I'm sure we'll be doing some research with our other municipal partners to see what they've put in place as well. So I don't anticipate there being a long period of time for us to make this happen. But I just would caution members of the public in terms of their expectation on what that's going to impact. The number of municipal roads in our community, in our county, is really, really small. So we'll have to continue working with our ATV associations and with the provincial government to, um, you know, to support shared road access on, on provincial roads. And that will be outside of the bylaw. The 2021-2022 Municipal Profile and Financial Indicators Report from the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing was the next topic for Council. Okay, and the next item is the 2021-2022 Municipal Profile and Financial Conditions Indicator Report. Any questions on that item? It's just good to see things going in the right direction, so we'll leave it at that. Tax revenue collection was cited as a challenge in the 2019 Municipal Profile and Financial Condition Indicators Report uh, that comes from the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mm -hmm. and it's flagged as a challenge in the 2021-2022 report um, so what was done um, and is being done to address that uh, that challenge? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's a it's a great, uh, I guess, flag in our municipal financial indicators report um, to, for us to be able to see because what we can also see is that if we look back at previous years, we are heading in the right direction. Um, so our financial staff has been working really hard on tax sales and uh, tax collections to make sure that um, we're, we're improving our position. And, and, you know, the reason that the province uh, does the financial conditions indicators is to give us a sense and to give the members of the public a sense of you know how how uh, sustainable is the municipality financially um, and that that's a really important point and so my feeling is that we're moving in the right direction it, it, it does continue to be a bit of a flag for us um, so we're going to continue to work on initiatives that help to kind of reduce uh, that out, those outstanding revenues but um, but like if you look back at where we've come from and where we are as of the 2022 report we are definitely moving in the right direction District 5 Councillor Brent Sampson raised concerns with rural mail delivery in his district. I'll move on to items added to the agenda and the next item is Canada Post regarding rural delivery and I want to thank Councillor Brent Sampson for bringing this forward to the attention of Council, of council because I know we did have, we experienced some interruptions ourselves there in the last month. So over to you Councillor. So yeah, just in the briefing note, I had several months back, um, I. I saw it happening with some parts of District 5, especially Lordways, Grand River, Grand River Falls, multiple areas like that that had a lot of service interruptions um, around their mail delivery. So uh, since then, things have gotten quite a bit better. Um, there were some hiccups even after we thought it was solved. They seem to have some trouble maintaining staffing for delivery of mail. But now I'm hearing the issue is becoming a problem. Yeah, the Rockdale, Grand Grave area, even up Seaview, Oban areas, to be honest with you. A lot of it serviced from the St. Peter's Post Office. So um, my ask here was whether or not we could, uh, as a council, ask Canada Post to send a representative in the future to meet with us at a council meeting so that we could ask questions and basically so the public could could view that and get answers. Just because there's a lot of people getting left in the dark, um, hearing stories, there was one person that, you know, they had a parcel wasn't sent out. By the time they got to the post office, they said, oh, no, it was here four days. We just returned it. But they, they had not gotten, a, like, anything in the mail to say the parcel had arrived. So it's not um, it's not business as usual with Canada Post, and I can understand some of the residents' frustrations with that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it would be, uh, if it were possible for Canada Post to send a representative here, just that we could ask some questions as to where they're at with their delivery and service delivery and and what the plans are. 
Thank you, Councillor Sampson, and I, I would 100% agree. I think part of the issue is there's no way for residents to know that there is even an interruption happening, right? And that's why you're missing important, potentially important documentation or, um, or parcel deliveries, that type of thing. So, um, so I guess, Councillor, you're making a motion to that effect? Yeah, I'll make that motion that we uh, ask staff to reach out to Canada Post to send a representative to a future meeting. Could I have a seconder, please? I'll second that motion. Thank you, Councillor Mike Digden. Could I, or any further discussion, sorry. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, that motion is carried. So maybe we could leave that with you, Troy, and we'll help find an appropriate representative. 100%. Together we'll we can, yep, yeah, we'll dig in, okay. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Thank you, uh, that's great. You had brought up about service delivery problems with the Canada Post. Um, and you mentioned that several months ago there was a problem. It seemed to get kind of rectified, but there's more problems. So maybe we can start first off. Uh, uh, what were the problems months ago? You mentioned something about parcels and stuff like that. What were the main problems? So several months back, uh, we were having some issues, mostly within the Lordways Grand River areas. Um, with a lot of the delivery, there was pretty sporadic delivery. There was stretches of days, sometimes a week or more, with no mail delivery. Um, the biggest problem was people weren't getting told, you know, what to expect. So a lot of uh, a lot of residents didn't know what was going on, didn't have any answers. Were kind of left in the dark. Um, the problem was, I guess they were struggling to hire delivery people and then sometimes somebody who knew would start they may last a few days or a week and then end up leaving for another position so it became pretty frustrating for residents they had no idea when to expect their mail um now in recent times the position or the situation is kind of returned and, and there's been more service delivery problems so the problems I'm hearing about now sound pretty similar, except they're uh, they're happening, I think, out of the St. Peter's Post Office, and a lot of it's uh, within the Rockdale Grand Grave area, some of those areas that are serviced from the St. Peter's Post Office. Um, from what I gather, they're having trouble with delivery. So it's similar to before, it just happens to be in a different region. Um, I've heard it even up as far as Seaview and Oban. Okay. And uh, you guys are hoping to get uh, some a representative of Canada Post to come to council and, and you guys kind of uh, voice some of the issues that you're, you've are you been encountering? Yeah, and I'd like them to be able to, to answer questions and for the public to be able to see it really at the end of the day. Because sometimes we can email them, we may get some answers, but uh, I, th I think it'd be It'd be a better service to the public if, if they could come here. All of council could ask them what their plan is going forward, what they plan to do to rectify these problems, basically. At a special meeting on June 13th, Richmond Municipal Council approved its 2024-2025 budget with no increases in residential or commercial tax rates. Noting that the budget is just over $17.4 million, the municipality said in a press release issued on June 19th that the budget includes funds for community grants to support local projects, landfill investment to ensure compliance with environmental regulations, and planning for future improvements in cellular coverage. Council also approved funding for the Department of Public Works to prepare water and sewer systems for increasing climate volatility. More than 5.4 million will go towards costs like policing, education, and valuation services the municipality said, noting that policing and education expenditures increased by over $365,000 from last year. The municipality said this was offset by cost savings realized through the revised service exchange agreement with the province and the increase in property values over the last year. The budget also includes health care funding for physician recruitment, senior safety and social inclusion, the Cape Breton Regional Cancer Care Center, and hospital foundations, the municipality added. So I guess we'll start with, the, at the beginning when we were talking about it, and you said uh, you uh, wanted to tighten up the categories, yeah. and you were able to do that. Maybe you can explain that a little bit. What yeah, you, what it you really, by that? really, that's more about uh, the presentation of our capital budget so that year over year, members of the public can better understand it, members of staff and, and council as well. So really what we did was we just kind of um, tightened up the categories around 
you know, ones that are approved and will be completed uh, in this fiscal year, and then ones that are approved and maybe would need some additional funding, and then ones that are uh, like approved for future, um, and then just kind of a, a collection of uh, ones that are not approved yet, but kind of we're thinking about. So it gives us a little bit more of a progression. The capital budget was sort of like that in the past, but we just kind of, we, we kind of refined it a bit to make it more clear. So yeah, maybe uh, if you want to talk about some of the highlights of the of the capital plan and the, the budget. Yeah, for sure. So um, the capital plan really uh, was infrastructure and sort of, you know, focused, of course, as it would be. Um, we have included about 1.5 million in there for uh, closure of the long, long outstanding landfill in West Arishat. That is going to be a huge liability that we're going to be taking off the books. Um, and it will be another step forward in our kind of environmental responsibility efforts. So it is long since past time that that was taken care of. We did the one in Lordways, as you, you might recall from a previous year. Um, and so we're, we're tr trying to get the municipality more in compliance with these environmental regulations because we really haven't been in those two particular cases. So, um, so really excited about that. Um, we do have, um, of course, the project set aside because we had been able to obtain some external funding through through the municipal capacity grant and the the SSGF as well to do the project here to you know increase the safety of the students and users of Ecole Poor and IFIT and and even the municipal office so that we would have a sidewalk available for people to to kind of separate them from the especially the bus traffic that heavy traffic that comes up and down so really excited about that project but I'm also you know really um, we, we the council discussed this at length and we remain very much committed to find finding a way to solve some of the cellular coverage issues in the county. So we continue on our capital plan to put aside funds that we want to be able to leverage with either provincial or federal programs um, to help uh, install more towers in, in the area. So we had attempted that in a partnership with Inverness County, I think a couple of years ago, we were not successful in leveraging the federal funds. We are going to keep at it because this is a huge priority for us. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I know, uh, you mentioned there's no tax rate increases. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the area rates, I assume there was some changes there and uh, were there some increases in, in area rates? Um, believe, I don't believe there was much change in the area rates, Jake. I think people will notice that they have pretty much held the line there, um, but I'd have to go back and look at the comparison from next year because there are so many of those. I'd, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Individual exactly. rates, yeah, mm -hmm. no, that, that's no problem. Um, but I, I suppose getting back to that, the fact you guys we're able to hold line on taxes yeah. is a is a big thing. Absolutely, and honestly, the, you know, when we looked at the impact of the increase in assessment values, which is, you know, many people feel that the or, or think that the you know assessment value that they receive uh, related for their properties is determined by the municipality. It's not. It's determined by a provincial organization, an independent organization called Property Valuation Services, and um, once they issued the valuations this last year everybody noticed an increase. I think the average increase in Richmond County was around 10%, but some people saw a lot bigger jump, you know, than that. And some people, you know, saw some reduction, but this is what we're, we, you know, from the data we've been able to collect is around the 10% mark. So we were absolutely not interested in, it, as a municipality, increasing the one thing we do control, which is the tax rate. Um, so we, we kept, we held the line for both residential and commercial. Um, we had some positives because of the, the service exchange agreement um, that, that had, you know, been dealt with earlier this year. We were able to remove some amounts from our budget. Um, but then, it, you know, what's happening on the, on the flip side for us is our, our uh, expenditures on projects and capital, you know, public works related projects, are, we're seeing the same kind of inflation that everybody else is. So, you know, costs are, are much, much higher coming in. So it's really been a, you know, a balancing act. And, and I have to say the staff in each department here this year, you know, they always do a great job, but this year they took an extremely deep dive to make sure that they could find savings and find, um, you know, efficiencies in their budgets and make sure that, you know, every every estimate they were tying to, they, they, were, they were putting into the budget was tied to a more realistic understanding of what the cost might is, is actually going to be you know we're going to be facing this year um, you know just people are facing it in their households 
the cost of everything has skyrocketed and um, and you know we're no different so we tried our best to to try to find ways to you know to integrate that and, and so that the, the residents wouldn't feel the impact they were already experiencing it on the assessment side we definitely didn't want them to experience it on the tax rate side mm -hmm. now you, you mentioned the uh, municipal uh, service agreement and uh, that the municipality actually benefited yeah. as a result of that budgetarily yeah. uh, Maybe you might want to yeah that. so um, so what that did was it removed um, things like the man so the mandatory contributions for a couple of items I think it was education ha housing there were a few things so that saved us a little over four hundred thousand dollars and I know when the service exchange agreement was being debated some time back you know there was a lot of pushback from you know uh, the CBRM in particular and I understand you know they're a very unique municipality and, and I would fully support that their their efforts to get a deal of their own you know because of the unique of of that particular municipality but there's no question it was a good deal for Richmond County and without that savings you know we would probably be having a very different conversation right now mm -hmm. so there was a change uh, I believe was mentioned in uh, in revenues uh, yeah, on the revenue side uh, in the budget well the, the entire budget revenues and expenditures have we you know we've estimated an increase of I think it's around five hundred thousand somewhere between five and six hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars if you compare the numbers uh, from last year to this year mm -hmm. um, and you know that's a direct reflection of exactly what we just talked about okay. right so um, but we you know we have um, you know we have tried to kind of make sure that we're maintaining and growing services for residents as well mm -hmm. all the work that's happening now through the expanded uh, you know recreation and community development uh, department you know and um, you know all the, the equipment rentals and all that stuff right so all of that is factored in at, at the very granular level and it all gets rolled up into this this really large budget so um, you know I, I actually was when we started this process I was thinking you know that the expense side was going to be much much higher but but like I said it was due to the hard work of the staff here that that um, really helped us be able to hold the line for residents this year thank you for watching Please tune in again to find out what we will be talking about on the record.